talked about continuity yesterday because um, oftentimes when you set upon a journey, when you set upon a path, when you take upon a task and you begin to do it well, people take notice. They want to be part of it. So you don't start and stop when you have the best interest of the people at hand. When we talk about the slant that our conversation will take, we talk about a background report, and that's where Francis comes in all the time. Francis, what did you find? Show us. With few months left to the end of this administration, how would Nigerians rate this government? It is well known to everybody, unless the psychopath will want to shy away from that, that the issue of infrastructure has been a very great achievement of President Muhammad Buhari. And the other thing is the fight against corruption. So these are the two things that I can tell you categorically that everybody in the country can attest to it that you know, Buhari has done very well in this area. In terms of infrastructure, I'll give this government 75%. And you know 75% anywhere in the world is A when it comes to examination assessment. This government inherited a very dilapidated infrastructure. But from what we have now, they have really tried in time of infrastructure. They have really tried. Second Niger Bridge has been on the pipeline from time immemorial. It has been a talk show, just for talk show. Nothing has happened. So just like uh, the architects we call the caricature of what you want to build. But this government has taken it beyond that. It is now a physical infrastructure that is on ground. And the South Easterners, we for the first time in the history of Nigeria since 1970, drive freely to the Southeast using first and second Niger Bridge. Another area where the President Muhammad Buhari-led government has recorded tremendous success is in the agricultural sector, with the introduction of programs like the Anchor Borrowers Program, Presidential Fertilizer Initiative, Special Agro-Industrial Processing Zones Program. The list is endless. The world is said to be a global village, so Nigeria cannot live in isolation. Some have argued that the administration has recorded some level of success in the digital economy. For instance, Nigeria launched the new national 5G policy in 2021 and successful licensing of two private companies to roll out 5G nationally. Beside the digital economy, what about the power sector? Any achievement thus far? Another area where President Muhammad Buhari's achievement cannot be faulted is in the signing of the Not Too Young to Run Law and the Electoral Reform Law which will improve the efficacy, clarity and transparency of Nigeria's election. When it comes to uh, stuffing of ballot box, it's no longer possible. When it comes to multiple votes by a single person, it's no longer possible. Yeah, there's a problem in the political space because it allows opposition to operate, it, there was a time in this Nigeria, an opposition party, they are not campaigning. You will see talks invading the campaign, chase everybody away. You will see that even some governors will not even release a uh, space like the stadium for opposition to campaign. But Buhari, through the National uh, Security Advisor, has won that if anybody behaves in a manner that uh, is intended to, to call, I mean, compromise the political party campaign. 
but we are stopping anybody from campaigning. Or if anybody is claiming to be thugged, that his government will not allow it. Notwithstanding these achievements, Nigerians are still asking for more from this administration as they look forward to a better local government system in Nigeria. When there is local government autonomy, the system of the local government will be in order. And uh, the, the citizens are the grassroots. We have and enjoy the dividends of democracy through the local government. A lot has been done by this administration and a lot more still needs to be done. Therefore, our focus on Weekend Deal today will be on President Muhammad Buhari's scorecard. Interesting and very in-depth as usual, Francis. Um, in the excitement to share what's happening in Akwai Bomb State with regard to federal government projects, from Akwai Bomb, we get this. Let's see it together. Good Road Network for Nigerians is one of the major focus of President Muhammadu Buhari-led administration since 2015. Many federal roads connect Akwaibom State to other neighboring states. This include Nongudo, Etinan, Ekomiman Highway, Abak, Ekparakwa, Ete, Ikorobasi Highway, Ikot Ekwene Umahia Road, Kalabaitu Highway, among others. The roads before now had been a nightmare or death trap to commuters and residents due to its deplorable state. The situation of the road before construction was bad, extremely bad, because every week you see two or three trucks falling down, tanker, tipping trailers, even buses. A lot of accidents was happening. We don't have road within this area. We find it difficult most times We go through the track road. And before you can get to the main road, is either your car spoiled or you are being harassed by miscreant or whatever. In fact, we've been finding it so difficult to assess this route. The road been spoiled well, well. Oh. The people say no vipers. Even this truck, then when they pass, they go just remain inside the road. So the thing been disturbed well, well. Because no, no fair good they pass here. So the thing, no market, everything just they dump. We have been suffering because of the bad road. And in, in fact, this road, a lot of lives has been taken. Road infrastructure is one of the major channels of economic development. Between 2016 and 2021, the federal government, through Federal Ministry of Works and Housing, has successfully completed and delivered 19 kilometer Nongudo Etinan Ekumiman Federal Highway. The intervention by the federal government has brought relief to users. I thank uh, my president for having this interest, I think trying to consider this place. The way we see the road and the road will very be good, more than this. Yeah, I appreciate the federal government. The federal government have done very, very well. At least uh, it has uh, made life very easy. It's a welcome development that they're beginning to look towards our dilapidated route. They have tried for some place that used to owe us. They, they, they put a uh, sand. And it make us to use and pass. So they, uh, we want them to continue the work till they finish it. That if the government will help us again in due time, the road, I hope, it will be the two length as we think. But now the situation is a little bit better than before. But we are begging the, the company and the government to do because because they have. If you look this side, there is no quota. If you look this side, as they have pee some of it. And if it continues like by rainy season, it will, it will get worse. We are begging at least from now to rainy season that they should better, do, do better than this. So that is what I'm begging them to do. The ongoing federal road construction in Akwaibom State has attracted commendation from the people and when completed will open up areas to more economic activities and put an end to their years of suffering. We know that there will be a speedy completion. And for Macquarie Bomb, is going to go all over the nation. This catchphrase is catching on. When you see something, say something. So Tete has been seen a lot in the agricultural sector in Nigeria. He has seen the inroads being made and know that if the farmers do not go to the farm, Nigerians will not eat. And we're eating, of course. Ayuba Tete, tell us. When President Muhammad Buhari took office in 2015. He promised to diversify Nigeria's oil-dominated economy by investing more in agriculture and encouraging farming. 
The government aimed at food self-sufficiency and increased foreign exchange earnings. The president launched the Agricultural Promotion Policy to succeed the Agricultural Transformation Agenda Policy launched in 2013 by his predecessor, Goodluck Jonathan. Everyone knows that Nigeria, before the advent of oil, was dependent on agricultural exports for, for its uh, source of uh, for, uh, income, generally. So every part of the country has some specializations that it had and which uh, the regions, I mean, through the regional governments, the federal government was harnessing to export. We all, like I said, what we tried to mimic with rice used to be the granite pyramids in Kano and uh, other northern states, you know. Then there was hide and skin, you know, in the north that was cut in two. And most of them, because of the rudimentary nature of the country then, were exported raw. So we were feeding the colonial environment, I mean, locations with uh, raw materials to power their industries. So in the south too, we had uh, the palm uh, kernel in, in, you know, in, the, in the east, and then of course cocoa in the west. And like I said, everyone, these were the mainstay. Unfortunately, with the advent of oil, when ordinarily we were supposed to improve upon those, uh, our basic uh, platform, basic foundations, we turned our back on, on agriculture. And that was how the slide started, and it dwindled to the extent that we have now become net importers of a lot of those products that we used to export. One integral program that was introduced is the Anchor Borough Program's intervention for agriculture, although it had peculiar challenges of its own. The Anchor Borough Program, which was principally funded by the Central Bank, is built on about three or four pillars. First and foremost, Prior, like I said, with the, the way we turn our back on agriculture, the farmers were left to their own designs. And since, by and large, there are these smallholder farmers. We are still the ones that feed us. But, you know, like I said, with time, it becomes very hard even maintaining the small holdings they had. You know, at a point before the advent of that Anchor Borough program, you have farmers that will even, a farmer that requires maybe four or six bags of fertilizer might be depending on, you know, buying fertilizer in Moodles. You know, and because generally, because of the limited resources they have, the yield is usually very small. So, and they are dependent on the rents. So after the harvest, they will sell some, keep some, and then, you know, maybe get some domestic uh, uh, livestock, you know, to, to tend to, so that by the next uh, rainy season they will sell, and, and how much does it amount to? So they were living generally from hand to mouth. In the midst of these programs and policies, some have posed the question, why rice? Why not some other cash crops that would grow the national GDP through international export? Before, around the time uh, CBN Governor Emefile came, you know, there was a policy that was enunciated where about 41 items were excluded from official foreign exchange allocation. And top on that list were food items because like we I said we became a dumping ground for foods that ordinarily we could produce so for the low, the low hanging fruits were for us to be sufficient in food first before you talk of exports you must satisfy your house first and then one of the most ubiquitous crop being produced actually is rice virtually every state you can produce rice so that was why primarily that focus because you start from the the one that that's what they call low hanging fruit the one with the most impact so at least we are able to start with that and other crops. After rice, we came to maize. You can see, soya is also on its own. So you have to feed the home first before export. With these successes recorded, what are the challenges and subsequent plans to alleviate them and the general plan for agriculture in the near future? By and large, one of the challenges, like I said, we have now is to introduce mechanization. So we needed, you know, local efforts to fabricate intermediate they don't have to be too sophisticated but at least they will remove the drudgery and they start attracting more and more people and even our investors another challenge we actually have with production is that it's still these small holder farmers that are feeding us 95 percent of the food we eat or even more is produced by these same small holder farmers the time now land will not be enough you know urbanization is increasing population is increasing so the same way so if you can improve the productivity of the same size of land, then you'll be able to produce more. So, and efforts are also, apart from 
improving the seats, you know, improved seats. We are also working towards introducing hybrid seats. For now, all the efforts we have been making is five, six, seven tons. But with hybrid seed, we can get 10, 20 tons. The same way a great river once started as a few drops of water, it is our hope as Nigerians that the few seeds that have been planted will grow into bountiful harvests to adequately feed our great nation. When we set our hands to the plow, then uh, more hands will come on board more farmers are dedicated and diligent, and there's more food at affordable prices for Nigerians. Um, for Mayuba Tete, we go to Sokoto now because the task of feeding over 200 million people cannot be borne by one sector of the nation alone. It's all hands on deck, feeding this hardworking and determined group of people. Sokoto, show us, please. After the rain is gone, Mother Nature leaves us with more gifts for our sustenance. Among food and cash crops grown around this time of the year in Nigeria, rice production has taken the stage for close to a decade. Mokhtar has had the first round of harvest on his farm. In spite of a number of constraints keeping him small scale, increasing demand for locally produced rice and commensurate market prices is a huge motivation for him to have hands on the farm. I have more rice waiting for harvest. For that one, it has been fully processed to make up to 10 bags of rice, which I sold at 20,000 naira per bag. Such is not the case before the ban on rice imports. Seven years following the ban on the importation of rice through land borders and a hefty tax on import of rice through waters, Nigerians are already definitive about agricultural policies of the present regime. There are at least 30 people working on Dami in this rice milling business. People with capital investment to produce five bags have grown to produce up to 10 bags or more because there is demand for locally produced rice. Abu Bakr Malami is managing the Sokoto State Agricultural Development Project, so close to the nitty gritty of the farmer experiences, to give us an assessment. On that, I can school the federal government first mark on the wisdom of banning the importation of the, the rice. But uh, had it been that the federal government subsidize agriculture by providing the both the seeds and uh, fertilizers and make the farmers mechanized you don't need to go to the street and ask a common man did he see improvement in farming so if we mechanize, we will cut down the cost of production to 70%, which will translate into more profit to the farmer and it will guarantee cheaper uh, cost of living. Rice is now widely grown in Nigeria, perhaps the highest record ever of the productive population in the country to produce 5.29 metric tons of rice in 2001. Uh, there are a lot of improvements in terms of agricultural value chain, in terms of the package of practice, in terms of the techniques we use in production, in terms of uh, the, the contribution uh, to the GDP. Jamilu is a frontliner, a state chapter chair of the All Farmers Association of Nigeria. In spite of the imperfections which he admits there are, he also holds more positive view on the outcome so far on the Nigeria's ambitious agricultural policies. But with the intervention, uh, a lot of training and uh, transfer of technology in rice, we have graduated our farmers from, 20, from 3 tons per hectare to 6 tons per hectare. Recently, however, 
scary rise in the price of fertilizer from 7,000 naira per bag to close to 30,000 seems to ruin the hopes of hands on the farm. Uh, uh, is, 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 a, is, is a factor that uh, uh, cannot be controlled immediately by Nigeria, uh, but I'm aware that the federal government is... Uh, in collaboration with some partners, they are, they are building a company that will be producing raw material for fertilizer. There are reasons to believe that agricultural policies by President Mohamed Buhari-led government are perhaps the most constructively daring in recent times. In time still, sooner or later, the results shall be adjudicated by master pen of history once again. Interesting from Sokoto there. Operation Feed the Nation. The country must be well fed so that they can continue to work assiduously and take us to an excellent level. We're talking infrastructure, we're talking agriculture about this great nation, and it's time for us to get to meet um, our guest, our first guest today. Oche Emmanuel is an Abuja-based legal practitioner and a public affairs analyst. It's great to have you on Weekend Deal. Good morning, Nigerian. Thank you. Ella, you were saying congratulations to the president at 80. An iconic age indeed. And a fitting time to be talking about the scorecard, his achievements, talking about Nigeria, the last seven and a half years. Infrastructural development. Progress? Yeah, um... If you look at um, the last seven years of the president, um, of course, a lot has been done, we agree, but a lot more needs to be done. Uh, the president at 80, he has nothing more to take from the country. Rather, all he has is to give back to the country. He's been there before, he's back again, and have done. he's running his last uh, one year in office. Um, in different strides of this administration, we can give him at least a um, pass mark. Say so for the security challenge which we have, which is not peculiar to Nigeria, uh, it's a global uh, challenge. And he's doing all that he can to ensure that Nigeria is safe, peaceful, and that lives and properties are protected. Uh, to Mr. President, at 80, we know you are advanced in age, but you, we know that you can still do more within your last few months in office. And we trust that before you leave the office, you will achieve, commission, and ensure that Nigeria benefit from all that you intended to do in office. So congratulations again. Interesting. Great. Um, let's look at uh, the second Niger Bridge. Many say it was like a storybook, a storybook that was not complete. Children have been reading it. Those children have become adults. And uh, can we say all of a sudden? I mean, for those of us uh, who have lived in this country all our lives, i say for those who were born elsewhere outside of this country, uh, we've used that link all of the time, especially during festive period. We know the challenge we face. Um, for Nigerian, it's a dream control. Not very many Nigerians will expect that within a short time in this administration, the second Niger Bridge will come into existence. And it is coming with all the technology that it requires to meet the yearnings and aspiration of the 21st century construction. So uh, for us, that bridge is, um, I mean, it's, it's an imagination come through. And we give the kudos to the president. Uh, we thank him for conceiving, um, sourcing for the funds, and ensuring that the construction is done. Among many other co uh, construction and infrastructural development that the president has attracted to various regions in this country. If you talk about the rail construction, imagine the rail from Lagos to about, about 156 kilometers. Standard gauge. That was never imagined. Abuja to Kaduna, standard gauge. Itakwe, standard gauge. And these are constructions that successive administrations before his time had uh, conceptualized but could not achieve um, with his good political intentions, with his good economic plan. He was able to conceive some of these um, rail lines, constructed them, and today they are all in use. Um, the waterway is the same thing. It is safe, cleaner, and even more accommodating as we are. Today, we look at the road construction in terms of um, road infrastructure. From uh, I, I, I drove on the road from Kaduna to um, Zaria the other day. I almost didn't know when I got to Zaria. 
because the road is so good in perfect condition, even though there are some constructions going on here and there. Imagine if the road is completed from Kanu, from Kanu to Abuja. Safety of road users, I mean, the, the, the comfort of driving on this road. And of course, the reason why we have um, bandits and kidnappers on our road between Abuja and Kaduna is just simply because the roads still have portals and, and all of those. So for us, the waters, the normal road, the railroad is kudos to President Mohamed Buhari. And we pray that successive administration will key into this progress and ensure that we have a better transport system in the country. Interesting. A nation that works hard together, a nation that is committed together, indeed succeeds together. Yesterday, uh, Michael Ohiani, uh, the Director General Infrastructure Concession Regulatory Commission, talked about continuity. It's so essential. And he emphasized that this government, the incumbent government, continued projects that had not been completed or that had been on paper. They progress from paper to reality. How essential is it to have a government that continues? For us, governance is a continuum. Uh, Nigerian leaders, once they come to power, they should ensure that projects that were conceived by previous government are completed. And they should also ensure that if there's any improvement to be done on previous projects, it should be done in tandem with the current reality of um, our economic challenges. Recurrent capital is all good. Let the people, let the citizens be the focus. When they are the focus, everyone will be smiling. We're talking about when you see something, say something, share something, tell Nigerians indeed what is happening. What, let's now look at agriculture. Uh, we heard about improved mechanized farming. We heard about um, more availability and affordability of fertilizer. Let's talk about that. This government again will be praised or will pass as one of the best governments that have given, given support to agricultural activities in the country. The Angkor Bora project, it's one project that every farmer in this country, at least even if they are not directly beneficiary, someone within the enclave of where every farmer lives would have benefited from the Angkor Bora initiative. Um, the improved seedlings that the government have initiated, the improved mechanized system where agric equipment are given to farmers, are given to states, uh, cooperative societies approach the government for assistance in that order. It has helped in food security, food availability, and has impacted very greatly, positively, on the economic lives of our farmers. Today, we produce enough to export from this country, produce enough to consume, produce enough to even keep in terms of storage. So. The president and the government of President Mohamed Buhari uh, will pass as one of the governments that have given so much attention for agriculture in this country. And we should, uh, agri being one of the major states, don't forget that in this country at the time, the kind of pyramid we had in this country was sustaining the country. Agriculture was the mainstay of this country before we shifted attention to uh, oil and then of course now we are trying to look at solid minerals and all of those. We think that if successive governments are able to cash in on the good ideas of this government, Agric will restore Nigeria economy and improve our GDP. Do we need to make for more effective transportation and to focus more on the middleman? What can we do inwards from here? For now, clearly, uh, the social strata that involves the middleman is clearly giving them um, way. And so what government needs to do to enable the poor have critical access to some national facilities is to ensure that taxes from the rich are used to subsidize costs for the poor so that in that order there will be sort of meeting point and this will of course reduce crime criminality and uh, many other challenges that we have in the society at the moment. I like what I'm hearing, reduction of crime and criminality, economic pace, gross domestic product, all keywords that Nigerians must familiarize themselves with as we journey onwards. Um, let me take a few messages. Uh, Donatus Wosu uh, from Ozubulu says, Yes, we appreciate the fact that there's a lot going on in terms of infrastructural development, but how would that translate into affordable food prices in the market? In fact, agriculture and the food prices that we have in, in Nigeria should not be localized to the availability of food in our country. 
because this food there are people who are buying to to export out of this country they are going to get paid and all the transactions are going to be done internationally in foreign currency and so all those translate to the cost of the finished product that we get so if you look at it if you put them side by side you find that we there's no rocket science whatever affects other commodities definitely will affect food prices in our market so it's just the same economic strategy I did like what you expatiated with earlier when you talked about economic pace and space and the gap between some people who are up there and some of us who are down below. I think basically we should keep hope alive, keep working as seriously. How about that? That's the point. Um, That's that the, point. the best is still ahead. That's the point. There's light at the end of the tunnel, like they say, we're waiting at the end. Donald Ogbona here, he didn't tell us where he's reaching us from. He said, great about infrastructural development is key. But this this is what we should expect. This is expected, well, after all, with the resources that Nigeria has well, at well, its disposal. Well, what are the resources compared to previous government? When we came in, when, the, when this government came in, we know what they were lamenting about. Uh, we know the cost, the price of uh, crude oil. We know what it was when uh, the previous government was in place. We know how the government came out to assist states with uh, funds to enable them pay salaries, to enable them even get started. At a point, some states were even unable to function at all. The government sourced for money and assisted them. So where were the funds? The funds were not there. It, takes, it took the ingenuity of this government at that time to be able to source for funds, got money from international uh, organizations and assisted states, assisted themselves, and we are stabilizing. So there was no fund. It's just a matter of political will, uh, seriousness, and of course, uh, the president's intention to curb corruption, which to an extent he has done, even though there is still corruption as well. Mm. But um, it does uh, tell a lot about his level of integrity, where people are not as open or as comfortable doing the wrong thing. What well, would you say? As well, we wrap up. Well, as we wrap up, yes, the president, as um, a personnel, yes, he has uh, a clean slate, his integrity clear, but we cannot use that to judge the entire um, the gamut of his leadership. We've had records of people who are corrupt, who are part and parcel of his government. We also know people who have been charged for corruption in this government, um, close friends of his. In fact, at the time, the secretary to the federal government was charged for corruption. Uh, and many prominent um, citizens in this country who are close to the president, who, who have had to have one thing or the other to do with such uh, corrupt charges. For the president, yes. If you're close to him, you have to sit upright. We agree. But once he's not there, what happens? Mm. So these are the questions. And we think as Nigerians, we should not, uh, we should desist from eye service to being, to owning this country as Nigeria of our own and doing the good things even when nobody is watching. For President Mohamed Buhari, uh, history will be fair to him. Most of the laws that have been made under this government, there are treaties that have been signed by this government that puts Nigeria on a very comfortable state in terms of everything they want to do in, in their relationship with other countries. Interesting. Always a pleasure to have a chat with you. Nigerians see something, say something, learn something. Oche Manuel, legal practitioner based in the FCT and public affairs analyst. And indeed, a proud Nigerian. We're greater together. Yeah. Interesting, great talking with you. We can do, we we'll take a break now. Nigerians continue to watch us and be a part of the program. Our program is interactive. We want to hear your views. We'll see you when we come back. It's week and deal. We want your messages. Tell us your thoughts. Tell us your experiences. We're sharing, expatiating the scorecard of President Muhammadu Buhari. We'll be talking with somebody that many people know in Nigeria. And it's interesting to know, completely surprising, she's a medical doctor. So let's meet and greet Dr. Beta Edu, the national women leader of the APC. Thank you for having me, and I'm happy to be here today. Great to have you. Yeah, and happy birthday to Mr. outstanding President. President Most Respected. Happy birthday to him, President Muhammad Buhari. Interesting. 80, big deal. Big deal. Iconic indeed. Yeah. Iconic. 
For you to see us, for you to hear us, for you to correspond with us, we talk about power, electricity. Where are we now? From where have we come to the point where we are today? Let's see some talk on power. Nigeria has a total installed power generation capacity of 16,384 megawatts. And power generation is mainly from hydro and gas-fired thermal power plants. While hydro plants provide 2,062 megawatts, the gas-fired power plant, on the other hand, provide 11,972 megawatts. Earlier in the year, there was a concern uh, noted about what appeared to be a dip in the power availability. And that got the um, key players uh, within the power sector on the government side working in harmony to address that problem uh, under the leadership of the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission. NERC worked with Nigerian Bulk Electricity Trading PLC as well as the Transmission Company of Nigeria to put in place a contract, a partial activation framework for the contracts in the power sector. Within the context of the partial PP activation framework, you now have a strengthened relationship between the gas sector and the power plants that they supply gas to. You also have a strengthened relationship between NBET and those generation companies. You equally have a strengthened relationship between the generation companies and the transmission company of Nigeria. In spite of this, almost every home in Nigeria has a generator or two, and in some cases, other alternative power supply sources, like the inverter, for example. Many say regular electricity supply is hardly guaranteed. Where uh, power is not readily available, you know, it has it cuts its impact cuts across. You know, businesses suffer, economic growth suffers, and uh, even um, at the home level, it also dis is quite disruptive. And um, the government clearly recognizes that this is a challenge. We see going forward a rapid um, decline in use of diesel genera generators in the country uh, because we, we, are, we are creating a, a framework that makes it easier for industries that want reliable grid power supply to be able to make that happen. Over time, power generation has increased in Nigeria. Despite this, the all-time high of its transmission was reached over a year ago in March 2021, and it totaled 5,615.40 megawatts. It is easy to question, why is power generation not matched by power transmission and subsequent distribution? If you look at the country's national development plan for 2021 to 2025, there's a clear recognition of the fact that energy is critical to development. So we see going forward, um, NBET midwifing the creation of a platform where power can be purchased by industries that seek to purchase power in the country. I'm not just um, a power sector um, staff. I'm also an electricity consumer. And so the pain of electricity deficit is a pain I feel personally. Uh, it's what keeps me awake at night. What gives me cause for optimism is that in the engagements I have, I see that same passion uh, in the room. Some experts in the industry say Power generation, transmission, and distribution will improve in 2023. Yes, it's growth. There are different stages of growth and development. Some may say it's not going at the pace they expect, or we run forward and then sometimes we seem to backtrack. But it's getting better. Sure. We're talking with uh, Dr. Beta Atu. Adu. APC Women Leader, yeah. tell us power, electricity. Yeah. I think um, President Muhammad Buhari has done a whole lot in um, improving different sectors in Nigeria. And power is one of those um, sectors that he has invested heavily on. I would want to start um, with the mass uh, metering system, which he was able to provide a grant from CBN about $60 billion that was put into it. Before now, you just have people 
receiving all sort of bills. So at the end of a month, they could come and give you 300,000 as your bill. Habitual prices. Habitual prices. They just come to your house and say, look, we saw three aces, five days, do this, this, this. And so you should be approximately using this amount of light, which was totally fraud, I think. Right. But today we have a system where you have over 300,000 meters. Um, the deal was to have 1 million meters across the country. Um, this has been paid for, uh, but installation is a gradual process and you have over 300,000 uh, meters installed. This is in addition to those who had meter before now. And I think that was one of the ways they used to regulate and check what's going on in the energy sector so that the private sector is not reaping the public of their monies. Um, beyond this, there was a presidential um, energy investment uh, which the president directly invested in solar renewable energy across the country. So teaching hospitals, I'm a medical doctor. I think about five of the teaching hospitals have been completely covered. So that way they don't have to depend on the national grid for light 24 hours. So if that goes off, the solar picks up or they don't have to run diesel all through just to get power. Um, for the primary health care, it was actually... A, a, a whole system. So over 200,000 solar powers were deployed through the rural electrification energy to primary health care um, facilities across the country. 200,000 primary health care facilities across the country. Uh, beyond primary health care, the educational system benefited from it. So tertiary institutions, primary, secondary institutions were also beneficiaries of this solar renewable energy. Um, beyond that, individual households. I remember very vividly, um, I think about three months ago, if I'm not mistaken, um, over uh, 100 houses in my community received free solar uh, um, lighting. And this happened across uh, the nation. So if my own community, not the local government, I'm saying just the other, my community received this, how much more if you have to times it by almost all the other communities um, in the whole country. So a lot has been done on introducing solar renewable energy. A lot has been done on improving the regulation. And then at some point, which the common man can testify because I hate to call figures, right? We were in this megawatt, now we're in this megawatt. If the common man does not feel the impact, then it's useless. You can call the figures for all you care. If distribution is not there and they cannot receive it, they then cannot feel it. Exactly. That it's useless. You're talking right? to yourself. Yes. So there was, uh, of course, the, the, the power supply has improved greatly. I remember for some two, three months, um, the whole social media, they kept going, look, Nepal has to take the light at this point because we're tired of seeing light. Uh, is this light to it for us in our house and all of that? So it's, it shows that the common man was beginning to feel or is beginning to feel that difference, that improvement in the But let me ask sector. you something. Is it possible for Nigeria to... Um, yes, we're celebrating. Yes, we have celebrated, which is good. But it's because of where we are coming from. Are we looking forward to a time when Nigeria can actually celebrate 24-hour electricity supply? Completely so. Is it possible? Completely so. We're not right. jinxed. We are not there yet, but it's a place we must be and where we're headed to. Right. One of the targets of APC, the APC presidential candidate, Asiwa Jubola Metinibu, is mm. to have that Nigeria where you can have 24 hours uh, uh, power supply without mm. thinking whether it will go off your soup in the fridge, your phone to charge or the rest of it. You just have the power. As long as you can pay for it, you have it. And he has put out plans, including mm. uh, privatizing and decentralizing the power sector. Mm. Uh, for me, I think having the power sector on the exclusive list and having it be managed by only the federal government is a bit uh, too on the high side. It's too weighty. Yeah. All hands must be Your on deck. deck. All sure. trained sure. hands who know really where we want to go and how we want to get there. Now, there's much talk about startups and the digital economy. Where are we in Nigeria? Let's see this and then we'll talk more. Digital economy ranks high among the achievements of President Muhammadu Buhari's administration over the past seven years. 
the rapid expansion of broadband access, which in August of 2019 had a coverage of 33.7%, currently stands at 44.65%, representing close to 3 million new broadband users. With the step-up of internet accessibility and upgrade of mobile networks from 4G to 5G and much more. President Muhammadu Buhari launched the National Digital Economy Policy and Strategy on the 28th of November 2019 and expanded the mandate of the then Ministry of Communication to include the digital economy. The sector's 14.70% double-digit growth rate was instrumental in supporting Nigeria's exit from recession which was triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic far earlier than predicted. Well, I'm not a politician, but this administration in the digital economy, they've done fantastically well. One of the good news I heard even from the Ministry of Recent is that the Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology, which is the best university in the world, they want to come and study the way we handle our digital economy here in Nigeria because they are fascinated by the growth. So it is something we all should key into. And another thing I must also mention also is the construction, the conception, construction and the uh, equipping of the National Center for Artificial Intelligence and Robotics. This is a house or a hub that houses prototyping, coding, artificial intelligence, robotics. It has been built now by this administration. The minister, I think, is doing a fantastic job, Professor Issa Ali Pantami. One of the things he has been able to do and what they are also doing is digital literacy. They are taking it to the doorsteps of people. December 2019 to January 2020, I was fortunate to be part of those that were trained even in Abuja on digital literacy. Now they've, they've already developed more than, nine, I think, specifically 19 policies for startups, for digital literacy, for providing the infrastructure, for many things like that, that they've already developed the policies that will help reshape the digital economy of Nigeria. NIMSI was established in 2007. From that 2007 until 2020, they only had the enrollment of, I think, 39 million people, database of Nigerians. Mm -hmm. But just when it was moved to the Federal Ministry of Communication and Digital Economy, they've had an increment of over 51 million people added. Now we have the database of Nigerians rolling into 90-something million. The digital economy remitted, instead of the 51 billion era they used to remit, they remitted quarterly 408 billion era to the to the conference of the government. So when that kind of money keeps coming, automatically you move out of recession. <laughs> People make money from the blockchain. And why? how they do that is playing games on blockchain. You're playing and you're earning. That's what's P2E. And there are a lot of other platforms where you can take advantage of that. There's augmented reality. There's virtual reality. Now, we, if it's not a big thing, Facebook will not change their name to Meta. And why they change their name to Meta is the Metaverse. It's an augmented reality. So if you think that it's not going to be useful, I mean, I, I think you are very far. It's going to bring in a lot of economic growth. That I can say for sure. The information and communication technology sector was the fastest growing sector in the fourth quarter of Nigeria's progress in digital technology, including the appointment of the Minister of Communications and Digital Economy as the chairman of the 2022 Forum of the Highly Regarded World Summit of the Information Community. Digital economy, interesting. And then we have a digitized woman leader <laughs> here. Everyone, you know, lightheartedly always yeah. calls you the digitized uh, woman leader. Tell us why is that so? And let's have your input. So I think the world has moved, right? Uh, this is the I generation, innovation, digital world. The world has moved. And in fact, COVID 19 brought to the fore the reason why the world and indeed nigeria really urgently needed to move right so at some point trading was all digital so you had more people this year and this period um immediately after covid more than ever before go online to sell things so shop owners had to create their own space online where they can reach their customers especially with the covid lockdown businesses had to go on schools had to depend on zoom transmission to be able to teach children for a couple of months 
Of course, I want to go a bit into the health sector and what President Muhammad Buhari has been able to uh, achieve. I would say one of his greatest achievements as a president was the ability to manage COVID. COVID happened and the entire globe shut down. And hundreds of thousands into millions of persons died across the entire globe. But in Nigeria, we had not up to 4,000 deaths recorded from COVID, right? And we were able to, um, through different measures, working with the PTF and the rest of it, overcome the entire COVID saga. Mm. That was a great fit in the health sector. Of course, beyond that, uh, the president has gone further to implement the Basic Healthcare Provision Fund. Remember, this was signed into law by President Goodluck Jonathan in 2014. However, implementation, which is always the problem with Nigeria, was kept in the back burner. So this is 1% of the consolidated revenue of the country being put into basic health care, provision of basic health care. The president took the bull by the horn and he was able to approve it and this monies have been released. And so it goes directly to primary health care facilities to provide drugs pay health workers to work there and maintain the primary health care facilities. If we have all these drugs here and health care is affordable and accessible, exactly. why the increase continuous, unrelenting increase in medical tourism? Okay, so the point is this, right? Medical tourism is usually bankrolled by special, the, the need for specialized care, mm. right? So we have this basic health care fund being invested in primary health care. Mm. So when you have people who have renal diseases and they need to have a kidney transplant or you have a heart disease and you need to have a heart um, surgery or you have um, cancer and you need to be treated or these are like specialized care that require very high expertise. Good. And not just the expertise in terms of the human resources, you also require high um, uh, level of equipment and the right environment to carry out these surgeries, right? But we so, want them to come here. Good. Home. So that's the point now. We lose close to $2 billion every year on medical tourism. Nigeria APC is working towards turning that around so that we can have both the brain gain, so we're bringing in experts, Nigerians, who are doing the same thing abroad. So the, the heart home. surgery, the renal surgery, which you're going for, you go to London, you go to all of these places, and it's a Nigerian that is there doing the same thing. Why can't we get that done in Nigeria, right? We need to create the right environment. We need to improve on the pay so that more people are not going out. They are coming in. Okay, let's look at it this way. Yes, there's a lot, there's a lot to to itemize and expatiate on and share great information. Are we where we ought to be? This is the African giant. How so, how accelerated will our steps be? Few months left, six months or less. How accelerated will our steps be to leave landmark achievements? Like you say, somebody is coming I, I in think, and has great plans. I think um, President Mohamed Buhari has written his name on gold mm. in the history of Nigeria. In all fairness to him, yes, we might have challenges, we might have shortfalls, um, security, um, the economy, which is not his fault. But it's a global issue. I'm sure you know what the inflation rate in the UK is right now. I'm sure you know the prices of food. At least the cheapest thing I, I schooled and lived in the UK at some point. The cheapest thing you can have, like it's everybody's thing, is food, right? Today, the prices of food have gone over the roof. And they're having issues. It's the same thing in Germany. It's the same thing everywhere else, right? So it's not necessarily because the government is bad, but it's because they have a global pandemic which shut down the entire economy and they're trying to recover from it, right? And it takes time. But I want to say President Mohamed Buhari has done a whole lot. His biggest, largest achievement for me is in the area of infrastructure. So perhaps we'll delve into um, infrastructure very quickly. So I think he has done a whole lot, um, beginning from the rail, 
ways. Of course, we know all the real Sibadan Lagos, um, Gage Rail, the Atape Wari, Gage Rail, even the 360 billion Naira Suk, uh, uh, Suku um, bond, which they have done several roads. In my state, they have done a bridge in Ecom, they've done the Ogoja, Calabar um, road. I think they're also working on the Calabar E2 um, uh, road and several other roads across the entire the nation. nation. You're bringing private sector into infrastructure. So he has done a lot of roads, rails. Of course, if you want to discuss the ports, you know how it is with President Mohamed Buhari, uh, the um, Abuja airport, the Lagos airport terminals that he completed and um, the runway in Enugu, in Abuja, which he did, um, going beyond that the approval for the Lagos uh, deep sea port and other deep sea ports, Ibom, uh, that's in Akwaibom, in Cross River, in Podakot, in Boni, and all of those, those are really landmark achievements of this administration which he has used to write his name in gold. I think the administration of President Muhammad Buhari have said less than what they have done and you do not understand the power of media and nursing it to showcase to nigerians that indeed these things have been done it's when you try to go to your village and you drive on a smooth road all the way the last time i went on the road from lagos to ibadan i felt the difference I but thankfully difference. we've been doing that for the last two days sure. we said nigerians must know and we are saying when you hear see something Say, say something, something. We and we're taking NTFR's. it nationwide oh, and indeed worldwide great. some also highlight his ability to continue sure. unfinished projects oh yes and they say that's a, that's, I um, that a good quality of a leader Muhammad Buhari, right he was one person who came into power and did not begin by disengaging everybody even though it was a different party switching to another party so it was a pdp to apc um, um, switch, right? One would think that everything done by the other administration should be abandoned. But a good leader understands that it's the Nigerian taxpayers' money. It's our joint heritage. So whether it's PDP, whether it's APC, I need to get the job done. Governance is different from politics. I must be able to deliver the dividends. And so he picked up all those projects lying all around and he completed them and he commissioned them. And I give him huge kudos for that. He was not quick to switch people in different offices and MDAs and all of that. He allowed them to do their tenor and then he phased them out and brought in people who, of course, would pay allegiance to his party. Dr. Yes. Better, I do. They really say you are a digitized women leader. Um, see something, you saying see something. something. Nigeria, you're hearing it. Sure. Okay. Quite well informed. Nice having this chat with you on Weekend Dell and Thank they're so talking much. to Nigerians and indeed the world. Thank Continue so to much. spread the word about the scorecard of our iconic president. What is a scorecard? A scorecard can talk. A scorecard can show. And we have combined talking and showing today, talking about the scorecard of President Muhammadu Buhari from 2015 up till now. Nothing added nothing subtracted so it's up to you to make of it what you will as we journey into another year God indeed.